evening and welcome to the program. Tonight on the show, we speak about sexual reproductive health rights. And really, it is a call for the prioritization of adolescents and young people's reproductive health. This show is done in collaboration with the support of SEHAD, Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, an indigenous non-profit research and advocacy organization, which is pioneering the justifiability of the right to health in the East Africa region. I'll very in quickly introduce my guests for tonight and I'll start at the very end. At the very end, we have Mr. Fajil Mande, a senior educationist. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much and good evening, viewers. Right next to him is Dr. D Dina Nachiganda, Assistant Commissioner for Adolescent and School Health. Thank you, Dr. Nachiganda, for joining us. Good evening, viewers. And right next to me, uh, Mr. Mondo Chateka, Commissioner for Youth and Children Affairs at the Ministry of Gender. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mondo Chateka, Assistant Commissioner in Charge of Youth Affairs, Minister of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. I should have completed the, the, the <laughs> whole title. <laughs> Thank it's you for that. <laughs> yes, um, and we're also going to be joined by two of our guests virtually. We have Nicole Musime. Well, that's Nicole Musime, and uh, also joining us uh, from the same uh, place is Anna Kukundakwe, who is a program officer with SEHAD. It's good to have you, Anna. So welcome once again to all of our, our guests tonight. Now for some background information, many young people today in and out of school face a lot of sexual reproductive health and rights challenges. We're talking about teenage pregnancies, child marriages, HIV AIDS prevalence and so on. These cannot be ignored. According to the Uganda Demographic Health Survey of 2016, Every year, 9,600 young people aged 15 to 19 are infected with HIV. So we are talking about 1,846 per week and 263 per day. Those figures in mind, we cannot risk keeping young people in the dark anymore if we are to prevent them from acquiring new HIV infections. With the outbreak of COVID-19 and the several measures schools were, cl among them we saw that schools were closed, the Uganda education system has over 15 million learners with an additional 600,000 attending schools in the refugee settlements. Most of these young people are locked up in homes with various challenges that include teenage pregnancy, mental health, gender-based violence, rape, incest, defilement, violence, among other things. So we'll very quickly start our discussion with that background um, in mind. First of all, for me, those are very scary figures. And uh, yeah. when I see we're talking about 200... 63 per day and I thought we we're doing really well on the HIV and AIDS scale. I don't know what the rest of my panel thinks. The picture is not good. The picture is bad and it requires everybody's efforts to see what can be done to change this scenario. It takes parenting to do a good job. It takes the schools to do a good job. It takes the community to do a good job. And I've already said that um, we should go back to the old adage that it takes a village to bring up a child. Mm. For you, Josephine, to think that you are going to take your child to school, now there are no schools, <laughs> maybe they are there, but they are, they are locked up. And I was reading um, data from National Corporation Council, and uh, I got more scared than I've been scared hitherto. When they said school completion is low, 35% of students complete senior four. So out of 100%, it's only 35% of our children that complete senior four. Among students who complete senior four, 25% go to senior five. Wow. So you can now ask, start asking yourself, how many go to university? It could be maybe 5% or 4%. And if you are talking about human resource capacity development, what are we talking about? Are we going to get the Fajir Mandis of this country? Are we going to get the, the Kalunjis of this world to do what you are doing here? Are we going to get the Dr. Dina to do what they are doing? I think we need to get worried. And what does worry mean? It means that we get ashamed about the situation in which we are so that we do better. In terms, if you're a parent, to parent better. If you're a teacher, to teach better. If you're a doctor, to doctor better. If you're a journalist, to give information that will help people change their behaviors and do a better job. Parenting, Minister of Gender came up with parenting guidelines and uh, Mr. Vajir Mali was talking to me and uh, congratulating us mm. over coming up with that. We are now coming up with um, a sexuality education guideline for the out of school. Okay, I'm, I'm very... How should they behave? 
Because Minister of Education came up with sexuality education framework for the in school. Now, Minister of Gender, because we deal with the people in the communities, we are coming up with sexuality education framework. But we need to know, Josephine, that many of the problems that our children face emanate from poor parenting. People are not there. People are not parenting. Uh, all right, Commissioner. Um, I think we should speak to the young person in the room. Well, not really in the room here with us, but who is joining our conversation. Um, and maybe she can also share some insights into where they think the problem is. We know that um, this country is made up of majority young people, over 70% um, under the age of 25. But we're looking at younger for this discussion, so say uh, 10 to 18, 19. If I was a young person, Nicole, and I needed reproductive health information, where do I go just now? Do young people know where to go? Nicole, uh, where do you go? Are you even comfortable when you get there? Or oh, the atmosphere is deliberately made and comfortable so that it discourages young people and shows them how much the community frowns on this and keeps them in school safeguarding their purity? You know, we used to go into centers and you would go asking for help, but we are at home and Okay, I'll give an example of uh, young people living with HIV. They really have to move very long distances to at least acquire um, those services. So it has left us to a point where we are the biggest group um, in the country, but then we are having very little to be given and we need a lot. So it is basically not there. And it is worrying, of course. Now, what does that leave us to? I'm, of course, going to go to my phone and I'm going to start Googling um, about something like, I am not seeing my period this month. What has happened? Because I don't know. Well, I am 19 today, but my mom doesn't really openly talk to me about these things because, uh, first of all, she's a very busy woman. A, a busy single mother who's uh, making sure that she gets bread onto the table and believe it or not 90% of African mothers are like that they they don't have that freely opening character in them and the liberal part and group of uh, uh, mothers they are working and they have very very limited time with their children so what does that leave us and to to ask my peer I'm like oh friend by the way, this and this and this is happening to me. And she's going to give you advice according to what she thinks. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be right, but that's what she thinks. And it gets us to, yeah, most of the times mess up because we do not know. We are knocking walls everywhere we go, which is getting the numbers uh, of the teenage pregnancies up there. Because believe me, by the time we are out of this lockdown, the numbers of teenage pregnancy from defilement, rape, incest, and sex with conscious, they're going to be up there. Not because these girls um, are having it as a fancy thing to do, but what should I do? They don't know. Most of them don't know what is really happening. Thank you very much, Nicole. And Nicole actually touches on parenting, as you'd, 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 you'd shared, uh, Commissioner. But just to ask uh, other panelists, um, what is the experience of young people that you've interacted with who need reproductive health information before COVID and even in the situation we find ourselves in now? Particular examples of people you've met and they need it, and you know, what, what do they look at as an option for them? One of the problems afflicting our young people is the problem, the health problems. Our young people, apart from early pregnancies, uh, uh, other forms of sexual abuse, HIV, AIDS, and other abuses, our children are suffering from a lot of health challenges. I'll give you, for example, you know, I come from the uh, background of education. When I was growing up in school, we used to have morning parades where we would be checked. Whether you bathed or not. Whether you bathed or not, if you washed. somebody would check <laughs> whether you washed your... I remember when I used to go to school, I didn't have shoes at, uh, when I went to Jinja Karoli Primary School from Chebando. Are you getting me? And uh, I would make sure that before morning parade, that is when the whole school was lined up and the teacher on duty would check whether you people are clean. They would check whether you have washed your ears, whether you have washed, uh, uh, you have combed your hair. I would make sure that I rub my feet in the dew oh. to ensure that my feet are clean. 
But that thing is no longer happening in our schools. And what is worse now is we are dealing with virtual learning as well. So yes, who's going to check? Exactly. Now, of course, now during uh, the COVID, now we are popularizing. Uh, of course, uh, it has been out of necessity. We are using that. So you can't even check. Are you getting me? Number two, how many of our young people are suffering from boredom today? Before we talk about defilement, even before, because part of the cause, cases, causes of defilement and other pregnancies is actually boredom. Are you getting me? The children have nothing to do, so the only thing which they can do is to go and, you know, play about with the uh, boyfriends or men and women and so on and so forth. You know, boredom is itself a big, big health problem. Then the other thing also, for example, there is another state of, of uh, health which is low self-esteem. Many young people, particularly at the, the age we are talking about, teenagers, one of the things teenagers suffer from is low self-esteem. What causes low self-esteem is because we don't actually, we, at home, we are not developing these children to learn other things, to strengthen themselves, to show their talents and so, and be proud of themselves. So, in short, Many of our young people, ladies and gentlemen, are suffering from health-related challenges which we quite often don't notice. Okay? Yeah. So we have that at home and now it is worse. The children are locked up. They cannot communicate with their mothers and fathers. During this COVID-19 uh, COVID, uh, uh, lockup, some parents are looking for the first time five minutes in the face of their daughters and sons. Before that, they never looked at I think members, you know very well that by the time a young person f completes university, they have been away 15 years from you. Now, during COVID, you are there facing your, your, da your daughter. You don't know even how to look. You don't know how to listen to them. You don't know how to answer their questions. You cannot. Whereas this would be the time really when we should be concentrating on educating we mothers and fathers, teaching our children new skills, teaching them new outlooks, making sure that we keep company with them so that they don't go wandering, as uh, the young girl has said. Dr. Nachiganda, where is the solution in that when, he, when, when Vajil Mande speaks about the, the, the health-related challenges that they're facing? Mm -hmm. Where is the solution in that? Have you had young people who come to you and they actually have nowhere to go or they simply don't know where to go for help? Okay, thank you very much, Josephine, and to all our listeners. I think, yes, there are some challenges for young people accessing care and treatment during the COVID pandemic and maybe even before, but worse now because of the various lockdowns of facilities. But just to say that at the Ministry of Health, we have given guidance on where and how young people can continuously get care even during the pandemic. And we've also given guidance on a few tips on how the parents can manage. I know that we've worked with Ministry of Gender to ensure that the parents continuously engage with their children. And we've also given guidance on, for example, if a child was gotten with COVID, what do we do? Let's separate them, males from females, underage from non, 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 you know, adults, so that they don't engage into all these bad sexual habits. But that said, we've also given guidance on prevention of COVID, even in the communities, but also in schools when they begin. And we've done this with the Ministry of Education and Sports. And we hope that in the continuous engagements we've had with the various partners on various social media platforms, webinars. We've tried to ensure that young people still reach out and get information on various health issues, but also to be able to report if they are experiencing any bit of challenges. So in a nutshell, we've continued to ensure that services are going on and we're ensuring that those who need services are still getting through our different partners at the various facilities, but also we are partnering with the private sector to ensure that despite the distances that they're now experiencing, at least in a nearby drug shop, they can get a facility that they would really need to get during this pandemic. So there is continuous announcements on where and how to get the services that there is. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Nachikana. Let's take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, we're coming to you from the Serena uh, Hotel 
Conference Center and um, the NTV studios. And we're speaking tonight about prioritizing repro reproductive health for young people and adolescents. <coughs> I'd like to engage Anna uh, Kukundakwe um, because I know that um, she deals a lot with, with young people. And I wanted to find out what is the state of sexual reproductive health rights for young people? Talking about the state of uh, sexual reproductive health and rights for young people in this time is actually, we go back to the st opening statements that you started with, the high teenage pregnancy rates, the high HIV infection rates. At the, at the time, by the t those are the st statistics before the, co the outbreak of COVID-19. So by the time this lockdown is all over, we actually going to have a double of everything you just mentioned. So uh, first of all, we start from, um, we go back to our, the national response uh, to COVID-19 that is extremely, that is and was extremely blind to the sexual reproductive health and rights. You know, all it cared about was the very, uh, the basics of wash your hands, do everything, but nobody was, um, was dealing, concerned about the sexual reproductive health and rights needs of young people. And we all know that with this global pandemic came with unprecedented measures where governments had to close schools to contain the, the spread of the virus. So the young people are now clopped down in their homes, you know, but we, they, are not, they are lacking informa uh, information about their reproductive health and needs. The parents who are supposed to be doing that, they are either incapacitated or they actually not, they cannot speak about these issues openly, you know. Nicole just told you that y she prefers to talk about issues of sexual reproductive health and rights with her friends or resorting to the media because her mother is either busy or, you know, uh, or trying to chase, put bread on the table. But also, as you may have think, um, watched media reports of, we think we have two districts where 60 girls have gotten pregnant in Luka and Kalilo district. So you talk about these are girls of school going age and when they are getting pregnant right now, how are they going to... Um, return to school or what does that mean for actually their future their children bearing children but also the fact that the the the, the presidential directives directed that actually all public institutions had to close including courts of law the young people some of them are actually locked down with the people who double as their abusers and this can be parents their guardians or even people the relatives or people in their neighborhood so even when they are defiled or raped they are not able to have access to uh the justice system because First of all, either they are un unable to walk uh, to, to where the courts are, but also the courts are not operating. So what does that mean for them? But also when you talk about um, issues, mental health, when you talk about a young person being contained in just a small space, you know, where they don't actually have a privilege to maybe enough space to where they are, they are able to, uh, to play, where they are able to maybe to say that I am going to go and visit somebody, they have to be tied up. So, and some of them are even living with, um, pe they are being exposed to, it's cases of GBV, they are seeing their parents fighting because they are agitated with each other. Mr. Fadil just talked about how people are not used to interacting with how to face their children. So that whole stress of fighting of parents and everything exposes them to mental health needs that need to be uh, prioritized and um, uh, and uh, you know and thought about. And then maybe lastly, the fact that even the e method learning methodologies being uh, proposed by the Ministry of Education and Sports are not cognizant of the sexual reproductive health needs of young people. You know, they are only content to classroom knowledge, you know, but if I don't have access to a friend, where am I going to tell a person that I'm actually experiencing painful uh, cramps? Who am I going to t ask a person a question about how I need to prevent myself against unwanted pregnancies? So all those are the challenges that sexual reproductive health challenges that we think have not uh, been paid attention to uh, during this time. Thank you very much, Anna. And I guess that points to when Nicole says she now turns to the internet and to her friends for solutions. Um, Commissioner Chatek, how is the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development responding to the numerous reproductive health challenges of young people that have been exacerbated by COVID-19? One of the things we have done and we continue to do is to create awareness that parents now, you have a role like never before. You are living with the children. You thought that you will send the children to Mr. Fajirumande's institution and Fajirumande will suffer with the children. Mm. Now, it is your time to look after this, these children, to sit with them, to tell them the A, B, C, D of reproductive health. And some of them have told us, we don't know what to tell them. How do I start How do if I no one to ever told me? Exactly. And so we are looking at ways and means, working with means of health, to see can we come up with strategies to enable them to know 
what tell them. And that's why, why the ministry is coming up with um, sexuality education guidelines for the out-of-school. Ministry of Education already come, came out with sexuality education framework. And so these will tell Josephine what to do, what to say, and where. But more important than even that is that the issue that parents keep on saying, we are too busy. People are looking for money every day. That's why we came up with the parenting guidelines. Now, we say that's not a chore enough. So we came up with different programs as means of gender. You have heard about uh, youth livelihood program. Yes. And you tell me, but that's for youth. Youth are producing. <laughs> we told you that teenage pregnancy is 25% mm -hmm. in this country. So many young people are in reproduction age. And so they are producing. And uh, then UEP, Uganda Women Enterprise Program, then Uganda Venture Capital Fund. We are saying that 89% um, of the sexual reproductive health problems emanate from poverty. Can we cure poverty? So that somebody is not uh, selling off the, ch the child because they don't have sugar at home. You speak about poverty being one of them. And I remember Mr. Fajilman mentioned that uh, boredom mm. was an another one. So you, yes. you address poverty. How do you address boredom? That's the other thing. Because if you address poverty, then it's possible that Mondo, who didn't have a radio, perhaps can afford to have a radio. Mondo, who didn't have a TV, perhaps can afford to buy a TV. And therefore, looking back at my home, I find my children, after looking at their homework, uh, do we still call it homework? Yeah. Or we call it <laughs> lockdown? <laughs> 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 so after that, they are brewed on the TV because the TV is there. Once they get off there, then they get on their, their phones. And they are on their phones and doing this and the other. And uh, you, you see, at least they have the capacity. But I'm looking at my person in Ikagoma, where I was born, where I will go a few days from now. They don't have a radio. And you see, the other day, I think the current Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs said the poor are producing more because they have nothing to do, to do but produce and so they go into their beds at six they eat supper at five when god is still providing the light they go and sleep and what do they do in sleeping they are looking for more children mm -hmm. and so we are thinking that uh, not thinking our strategy is that if we address the poverty issue in this country we would have addressed a number of problems including the health including the education, including the issues of boredom that we are talking about. At least if a child is going to watch a movie during the day, because there's a TV there, but look at my person in Kagoma, in Mutai, who doesn't have access to electricity, doesn't have access to a TV, doesn't have access to all the things we are talking about. And so, to me, Karunji, that makes a lot of sense for us at Minister of Gender. Uh, the other thing uh, I talked about already is uh, partnering with... Uh, other civil society organization. I'll mention but two. One of them is Naguru Teenage Center. Mm -hmm. This hopes to attend to the young people, to tell them about their sexuality, mm -hmm. to counsel them, to guide them in the absence of the community development centers that we are trying to revive. We are trying to revive the community development centers. Reproductive Health Uganda is another civil society organization that we partner with to be able to reach out to there together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Dina uh, uh, Nachiganda. She hates to be called Dr. Dina uh, because she has a totem and she comes from somewhere. So I'll try <laughs> to avoid that. And so with this partnership, and by the way, this partnership is anchored into a law and policy. The private-public partnership policy mm -hmm. and law does empower us to work with civil society organizations, to work with other development partners to ensure that we deliver as one. Right. I've seen quite a number of advertisements on TV uh, playing about a child going to speak to her mother about her, her pregnancy and the mother says, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nechikanda, what is the state of the national adolescent health policy that the ministry has been reviewing for the last three years? Okay, thank you. Um, like you've ably said, we've been reviewing this policy for the adolescents. And I want to say that we've done all the work that it requires to be done. 
I think at the time when we should have finalized it, um, we had a new guidance on area assessment, which is a regulatory impact assessment to ensure that whatever policy we are bringing up is surely needed by the people. So when this came up, we now again worked towards completing the regulatory impact assessment, which we finished around end of last year. And then it's really at, uh, prioritized at the Ministry of Health. Once this goes, once the report is given to Cabinet, it will be presented, and hopefully Cabinet will be able to pass the policy for adolescents in this country. All right. Um, I, I think I'll pose the next question to you, Mr. Mande. Yeah. What does the Ministry of Health need to put in place to meet the numerous health challenges of young people during this period? Is there something our education sector is missing as they provide alternative means of learning? You mean Minister of Health or Minister, Minister of, of Education? Ministry of Education. Uh, Minister of Education. One of the things we need to do, first of all, is I am pleading, let me use this opportunity on NTV, to plead with every ministry that has got a policy to do with the youth, please to speed up that policy. For example, Minister of Education uh, has got uh, for the uh, uh, more than I, I, I th uh, more than how many? 19 years. Yeah, 19 years. There is a policy framework draft that was put in place, but it has never been approved and it has never been implemented. That is before we look at the ability to actually make sure that the policy is put in place. Then number two, continue the efforts of working with other departments, with other ministries. A minister of health, I mean minister of education, may not be able to do the job alone, for example, of dealing with the, uh, the health challenges with the young people. Let them continue working with the Minister of Gender and Community Development. Let them continue working with the Minister of Health. Let them continue working together. So that collectively, now, we can cover the young person. Because we have had one problem. And th one thing, I think all of you viewers have noticed it. Everybody thinks that education takes place only at school, which is very false and very wrong. Education takes place at home first and foremost as the first school education takes place in the community that's why we used to have community development centers when uganda was coming up and i am saying we need to establish that education in the community what education is taking place in the community now what education is taking place in the homes now and of course education takes place in the formal school then of course during this time I think on top of the material which the minister has been sending out, can we try a message on the other health problems which are, have nothing to do with academics? Because already the material, as usual, because now we have a big weakness in the country that we think that everything to do with school, with education, is only towards passing examination. Which I would like us to know, I think COVID has taught us that we've got to go beyond passing examination. Messages should be going now, for example, and nobody has sent out these messages to the parents. One, first of all, parents, how can you help in teaching your child? Number two, what co-curricular activities can a young person take part in during this, this uh, COVID period? Are you getting, we talked about boredom. So, me, I would like to suggest that the Minister of Education, probably working with other men, can send out a guideline. I see guidelines. Our boys and girls do not know what to do, and that's the problem during COVID. People do not know what to do with the 24 hours times the six months which we are spending at home. That's why they are bored. And then, of course, self-esteem. What other activities can we guide the, the students to engage in? I think we can guide them, of course, Eventually, even after the COVID, we need to do a lot of training the parents so that the parents play their part. We need to, to expand the knowledge levels and skill levels of our young people. Okay. Right. Um, thank you, Mr. Mande. I think one of the things that uh, Commissioner Chatek had, had spoken about was that the private se sector needs to come in. And I think the private sector has done quite a bit in trying to, to fill that gap. But let's take another short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. I would like to start um, this segment with Nicole um, in Studio B. Nicole, I, I would like to hear from you as a young person. 
how you would like to see change begin to happen? What would you like um, to see happen and who do you think should be the person who steps up to make, to, you know, to, to help this change happen? I've always had this saying that we belong to the government. Okay, it doesn't have to be Ministry of Education. It has to be everyone to help us become better people because we are looking up to them. They need us, but we still need them too. Yeah, so everyone really needs to step in to help us become better people. But it doesn't actually just stop at us, but it actually takes a step ahead. Because if you say you're going to make a bit of changes, well, um, a lot of rumors have always been going on about um, the, not actually rumors, but then, okay, it might have been done, the scholastic materials and everything, but I am a kid in Kampala, but I never got to receive those things. So what does that mean? How about this refugee child, this uh, uh, girl or boy from uh, a fat rich area, who never even heard the news about it? If I did not receive those materials, how about them? And at the end of it all, we're going to sit for the same examination. So is that really fair? Of course it, it's not fair. And it gets us to another problem that now that we are in lockdown for four months already, um, we, it's like everyone has forgotten the fact that as uh, girls and women, that is uh, something that is part of us and it's called um, uh, the, the menstrual cycle. So our menstrual hygiene has actually gone so down because uh, it's so hard for a girl to move and look for uh, those materials. Now, what does that get her to? Of course, it gets her to a lot. Yeah, when you talk about people, uh, students doing e-learning, well, I might do e-learning because I am in a signal range area, but how about this other child who's very far from the city, whereby even the radio signals can't reach? Not, not only can they reach, but they are struggling to get something to eat. It is four months now, and if anything goes wrong, of course this person is either going to die of starvation or she's going to find other ways to get a way out. So, yeah, everyone needs to step up because this is the time when um, they need to show us that we are the future of this nation. If they don't get to put us to lie now, we're going to go astray and what will Uganda have next? Very much, uh, Nicole. Nicole, you make a very, very uh, passionate <laughs> closing remark. Anna, do you want to take it from there and, and just share with us what you think needs to be done and who should step up? From where um, Nicole stopped saying that while everything else is under lockdown, young people's uh, SRHR issues are not, the uteruses are not closed down. So therefore, they are, they are still exposed to sexual reproductive health and related challenges and teenage pregnancies. Their menstrual, the, their menstrual periods have not locked down. And so every other month, they have to, to menstruate, which also makes sure that they still have to face the challenge of not, them having, not having access to, uh, to um, necessary materials, reusable parts, or any other bit that they need to use to make sure that they have dignified menstrual, uh, uh, a menstrual life or menstrual cycle. So what that requires is that everybody has to step up their game. If we talk about the Ministry of Education and Sports having to develop a policy for the last 19 years, you know, I was a toddler when that process started and now I have grown up, finished school and I'm doing advocacy on the same policy. So we, the Ministry of Education and the responsible people in that ministry need to step up their game to respond to the numerous health challenges that are affecting young people. And then um, we also we need to talk about the access to justice. Um, the judiciary needs to really uh, step up their game in ensuring that they deliver just much needed justice to the young people whose rights are violated. You know, the police, can they stop m negotiating with rapists, with people who have raped, who have defiled? You know, the teachers, when we send the children to school, can that, can we, can that be the assumption that we say that we're actually putting them in a safe haven? Can we stop having uh, our children or our young, 
uh, people being defiled from school, being beaten, you know, um, being given corporal punishments. And then, of course, and think more than ever, COVID has taught us the way Uganda got united and the world got united knowing we had a pandemic uh, to deal with and everybody had to cooperate, wear masks, sanitize, wash your hands. I think it's the same approach that we need to use to respond to the sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, needs of young people. We need to have the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development come up and empowering, uh, empowering a parent on how to parent. How do you speak to your child about sex? You know, um, the very hard conversation. We need to have Ministry of Health come up. The parliamentarians, I would just call upon everybody and then the media, you're doing an amazing job by bringing these stories to light. Even when we know they don't make as much selling headlines. Can you continue to amplify, you know, give young people a platform to actually make sure that they air out the challenges that are affecting them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. We can, we can agree safely that the private sector, the media especially, has done quite a bit. If there's one thing you should give us some props for, it is it bringing these issues to light. So we yeah, thank no. you very much the for that. Thing, <laughs> I really feel that you have done a fantastic job. Thank you know, you things much. don't happen. Things are made to happen. And you know, we are moving towards uh, National Population Day on 11th, 11th, International mm -hmm. Operation Day. And you know, the issue I keep telling people that, you know, around this time, if Fajiru had about 20 children, it would have been a tug of war to look mm, after them. Of course. If you have two or three that you can carry and look after, it's a little cheaper and you can look after them. So even with the lockdown, people mind the number of children you are going to bring into the world because the responsibility of bringing them up it's lies right. squarely on you. Right. It's your duty to do and to bring them out. How do we fix the situation we find ourselves in? What COVID-19, the, the, you know, the, the Pandora's box that it has opened, the things that we're beginning to see, um, all the challenges regarding sexual reproductive health, how do we begin to deal with that? One of the things that you discussed as listening to your conversation during the break was um, the mobile vans that used to go around. What other solutions do we see? Mr. Mande, I will start with you in closing. <laughs> what do you see as solutions for what is before us now? I think the first solution is big, big training for the parents. Parents do not know what to do with their children. They don't know how to relate with their children. I would like also to strengthen, uh, to plead, that we strengthen the department of the public health department. We used to have district inspectors of health moving around homes. Number two, we also need to lift up the departments of the community development officers, mm -hmm. people who used to do the education of the community so that the communities are educated. Those offices are still there, but they are idle. Let's wake them up. And finally, Every ministry, including Minister of, of Education, which has got a policy that has been in making for a long time, please complete that youth policy, youth health policy, complete it now, and let's make sure that we implement it now. We must redeem our country. Nobody will come from abroad to redeem Uganda. We ourselves must redeem Uganda now. Let's right. push into action. Thank you, Mr. Mande. Isn't it funny, though, that we continuously say that the family is the, the you know, the, 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 the unit or the foundation yes. of a country, but it is the one that we disregard the most. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Nechiganda, a lot of fingers have been pointed about these policies that, uh, you know, just still in, are still in the works years and years over again. What is your final say in this conversation mm -hmm. as a promise from the Ministry of Health to the young people who are watching? Okay, finally, I just want to say that young people are very important in this country because of the bulk that we have in this country. We've already mentioned the statistics, 70% over 18. That's really big. And we also know that uh, adults are the smallest if we are to talk about the demographic dividend, which I will not talk about now. But largely speaking is that we need to invest in the young people. We need to approve the policies. And like we have said, the adolescent health policy should be approved soon because there is goodwill to approve it. But also still in my closing, I want to say that um, adolescent and young people's health is not a medical issue only. It's an issue for everyone. I think every speaker has alluded to this. We have to come up together and we work towards the adolescents together. Finance, no one has spoken about Ministry of Finance, but they are very key in, for example, skilling the young people and ensuring those who drop out of school can continuously do other vocational courses and still live well in life. 
Let and and we about... know that when uh, we come out of the lockdown, a lot of girls are not going to go back to school. Yes. Yeah. So we really need to skill this and we need to work with finance, for example, to ensure that such avenues that uh, Mr. Chateka already spoke to can be implemented. We need to work with works and water to ensure that there is water everywhere in the schools and in the communities, to ensure good hygiene and sanitation. We need to work continuously with education, which we are working with. So I just want to say that the health of adolescents is not only a medical issue. The families come in, like you have said, and the parents. So we just need to get strategies that put us together to ensure that the young person and adolescents live to their maturity and they live successfully in future. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Nachikanda. Commissioner Chataka? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Josephine, for hosting us. There is uh, a man that I admire, that I still believe he lives up to date although he died. He's called Nelson Mandela. He said there is no <laughs> keener revelation of a society's soul than the way society looks after its children. And so this should be in the hearts of everybody to evaluate yourself. How are you looking after your children? Now that they are even closer to you during COVID-19, another author said that you know at the end of times when the beckon beckons, it will not matter how filthy you are what it was, but how many people's hearts you touched, and especially the children. And so I want people not to think that the issue of children belongs to means of gender alone, or belongs to means of education alone, it belongs to all of us. And so we need to do everything possible to ensure that we have a population that is well nurtured, that's well cared after, that's well fed, whose nutrition is well balanced, you know, at the end of the day, we shall judge people by the children they are brought up and how these children have been brought up. All right. Um, I thought one of you would also touch on solutions in the communities in the sense that if we have those mobile vans that you said you grew up with in mm. a certain generation, driving around and somebody is screaming and saying, look, do this and do that, are these home-based solutions that we can use? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are things that used to work then. These are things that can work even now. Because if you passed through my village in Mutai, where I was born a number of years ago, I don't want you to know how, years, <laughs> how many years ago I was born, and uh, you had a film van, and it's talking about spacing children. It's talking about nutrition. It's talking about taking children to school. You know, there's nothing as important than education for yeah. the children. But again, education for the children when they are on empty stomach, again, it doesn't work out. And so that's why means of health is, is, is important, means of education is important, means of gender is important, means of agriculture, the people who dig and bring food on the table are important. And so telling, there are these things that we feel that people know, but you know, people don't know. Yeah. And let's not imagine that people know. Let's tell them even what we think they know. I've been talking about the issue of toilets. You know, I always tell people that the first house I built in my life was a toilet. When I was building my first house, I had to build a toilet first. And so that was the first building I, I built. But you know, many people don't have toilets. And if you don't want to talk to them about it, and you imagine they know, then you get it wrong. If I am a chairman of a village, if I am a, a chairman in an area, let us begin thinking that as a chairman or a chairperson of this village, what program have I put in place to engage the young people in my area? We said already about the development of the community development department, mm. but let's begin with you, Chairperson. We are handling this as an emergency. Do you have a program how to engage your young people in your area? If yeah, you sit down with your council, you will have something to do and you will implement it and it will work. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Fajil Mande, Dr. Nachiganda Dina, Mr. Commissioner. Mondo Chateka, uh, Anna Kukundakwe, who is on the other side, and Nicole Musime. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us, for taking the time, and for informing our viewers who are watching this program. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition. Mm -hmm.